Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Redstone. In this video, we're going to be talking about the obscure logic gates. The ones that exist, but you really don't use all that much. And really, if you're just here to learn practical redstone, the redstone you're going to use, you can skip this video entirely. Almost all of these logic gates are going to be used strictly in theoretical purposes, which you won't need if you're just talking about practical redstone usage. But, for those of you who are interested, or just want to know everything there is to know about redstone, there's this. And, let's get started. So I'm going to start with the really lame ones. And first up in the really lame category is the true gate. In this gate, no matter what input combination you put in, it always returns a 1. And, I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, okay, that's incredibly stupid. And you're right. It is. By the way, it is the code B15, for those wondering. <laughs> but, this gate is, as you can see from the black wool, it's a theoretical gate. Its primary usage is in theory. Sometimes you would prefer to use a true gate over a not gate if you're doing theory, but, you know, we're mostly not doing redstone theory, at least in this series, but... If you're doing redstone theory, you might sometimes use a true gate instead of a not gate, if you always wanted power, or instead of a torch or something, I don't know. It depends. But really, the big time you come across these is just by accident. So, for example, if I create a logic gate where it's like... Well, actually, it's more actually a circuit. So I'm going to start with a NAND gate. And I want the output of the, of the circuit to be either NAND of A and B, or if I'm just getting A. This creates a truth gate, even if it doesn't look like it. Because no matter what input combination, it's always true now. So the big time you're going to see them is just when they're created by accident. But if you're into redstone theory, you can also find them there. But I'm assuming most of you don't do that. But anyways, so that's a true gate. Nice, simple, very easy. So next up is the false gate with code B0. This gate is a lot like the truth gate, except instead of always returning power, it always returns no power. So no matter what input combination I put in, I'll never get power out. And this isn't used quite as commonly in theory, not that they're used all that commonly anyways. You're pretty much never going to see this unless you create it by accident. You accidentally put some logic gates together that never returns anything. So that's the big time you're going to see this one. And that's the false gate, pretty much the opposite of the truth gate. And last of the three really lame ones is the identity gate, code U0. This gate only has one input and one output, and whatever you put in, you get right back out. And just like the other two, this is one that you really see most often by accident. So, yeah. It is used in theory. It is actually used probably more commonly than the truth or the false gate in theory. I've used it in theory before. But, again, I'm not teaching redstone theory, I'm teaching practical use of redstone, so there you go. And those are the three really lame ones. So, after this, we're going to move on to ones that are really uncommon, but they still have some practical use. So, let's go ahead and go over there. And one last thing about these free gates. The big reason they're here is simply because it's possible to make a redstone device that acts like this. If it wasn't possible, then they wouldn't bother naming them or creating them. But, you know, once they named them or created them, they found they have some use. Unfortunately, that use is really inferior. There's really no logical reason why you'd build a gate that just spits back out the exact same thing you put in. But, yeah. So I just wanted to point that out there for people thinking, oh, these are the most pointless logic gates ever. Because, technically, they are. But, you know, everything I just said, I'm not going to repeat it. So anyways, now moving on to the ones that are actually used sometimes. So here we are, the first obscure gate that actually has some use. It's the implication gate, also known as the implies gate. It has code B11. This gate is a little bit of a strange gate. It's a little bit hard to grasp the concept of exactly what it's doing. Logically, what it's doing is just it always returns power unless you flip input A and nothing else. And I know that seems really weird as to why that would ever, ever be useful, but believe it or not, there is. It has to do with material implication. 
also known as implies. And I'm not going to go too deep into what material implication is, because there's actually a huge debate among, ma among mathematicians on the best way to explain material implication, so, you know, it's, it's a debated subject, I don't want to give you a bad explanation. But here's my best explanation to at least get the concept across, and not really go into detail of about what exactly it is or when you'd use it. So, let's say, for sake of example, input A is representing an earthquake. The, when I get, have no power, that means there wasn't an earthquake. When I have power, that means there was an earthquake. And input B represents whether or not people die. If power's off, that means no one dies. If power's on, that means people died. Now, if I made the claim that every time there's an earthquake, it causes people to die, this is what the implication gate would be used for. It would be used for testing this claim. So, first on if I put in the information. Right now it's saying there was no earthquake and there no one died. So, therefore, my claim still stands because p no one can die if there's no earthquake. That doesn't defeat my statement. So, another case is if people die and there was no earthquake. Well, while it does say that earthquake causes people to die, it doesn't say earthquake is the only thing that causes people to die. So, people can die and not have an earthquake. So therefore, that doesn't disprove my claim. Now, if I said people die, uh, there's an earthquake and people died, that's exactly what my claim is stating. So that still doesn't disprove my claim. The only thing that would disprove it is if there was an earthquake and no one died. That's the only case where, as you can see, my claim doesn't hold up if this one case happens. And there's a few cases where things like that pop up. Usually you're not using redstone to compute whether people die from earthquakes, but, you know, in games this is sometimes used. I think that's probably the most common place, even though it's not e that common even there. But, you know, it's sometimes used. It, it's not common, but it is sometimes used. And that's my, that's my best explanation of getting the concept of when this would be useful across. So yeah, that's the implication gate, code B11. Hopefully you understand that. I know it's a little bit of a weird gate, but yeah. And, yeah, why, why not? Since this isn't a mostly theoretical gate, I'll show you how to build it. So all you have to do is you have to have input A here, input B here, and the output. Now output's going to get powered by a torch, and the only thing that can power the torch is that, I believe, or am I doing it backwards? Actually, I believe this does make an implies gate, even though it's a little bit of a derpy one. Oh, wait, no. Okay, I am doing it backwards. So this would have to go over this. This is a really bad implies gate, but... This does show you how to build it. <laughs> this is one really weird design for an implies gate, I guess. But, it, yeah. It's not exactly what I was intending to create. I was intending to create what I had built in that redstone cell. So actually, I'm going to look, because I'm not sure what I built. I know I built something that's a lot simpler. Yeah, this is what I did for that. I just inverted input A and sent input B straight for the output wire. This is what I did for the actual cell that I was using to demonstrate. Which is probably a better design than whatever the hell I just did, so yeah. If you want to build an implies gate, that's the design I recommend. Very fast, very simple. And yeah, that's the implies gate. Now, moving on. So, of course, there's the non-implication gate, or which has code B4. And this is just like the implies gate, in fact it's even also known as the inverse implies gate, except instead of returning whether or not your claim has been disproven, rather th whether the... Eh. It's returning whether or not your claim is broken, as opposed to whether or not your claim holds up. So it's essentially an implies gate with an inverted output. So only if I flip input A by itself do I get an output, because that's the only case that disproves my claim. And yeah, there's the non-implication gate. Now, there's also the converse implication gate. This is a little bit weird. This is because most people don't really understand what the word converse means. By the way, that's code B13. I don't know if I showed you, but non-implication is code B4. But anyways, back on topic. Converse, lo the logical converse of something, simply means the inputs are flipped. So instead of testing if input A implies B, I'm testing if B implies A. So using the earthquake example, this would be testing if people dying means there always was an earthquake. If 
So if people died and there wasn't an earthquake, that would disprove the claim. If there was an earthquake and no one died, well, you know, it, you get the idea. It's the same thing as implication gate. This inputs are reversed. And also there is the converse non-implication gate, which is my favorite logic gate just because of how ridiculous the logic in the name is. So this is like the non-implication gate, but inputs are reversed. So it's testing if B implies A and the input is inverted. So yeah, only case it's true is when B is on. Yeah, very weird gate, <laughs> I know. But yeah, and those are all the implication gates. Don't worry, we're not going to do any more. But yeah, so there you go. And now moving on to the final four logic gates. So next up, the negation gate, code B3. Also known as the P negation gate, and you'll see why. So the negation gate, in terms of strict functionality, essentially acts like a NOT gate for input A. And input B is essentially just ignored. Which might seem a little bit weird, but its big use is in theory, or if you want to have input A inverted and then want to do something else with input B, that's a case when you'd use the negation gate. I I'm sure you've used it many times before, even if you j didn't realize it. If you ever took a logic gate like an AND gate, so if just for an example an AND gate, and you inverted one of the inputs, unbeknownst to you, you've just actually inverted this input. That's actually another gate, which I'm going to talk about. Actually, it's going to be this one coming up, but anyways. If you just invert input A like this, this is actually creating a negation gate. You're putting it through a negation gate, and then you're putting it through an AND gate. So yeah. So its big use is in Redstone Fury, but that one actually does come up practically a few times as well, like such as right there. You just usually don't think of it much as a logic gate. And the reason it's called P negation is because, again, it just inverts input A. And now, there's also the converse negation, also known as Q negation, with code B5. And predictably, this is inverting the other one. So, it's an AND gate thing. If I had first inverted input A, if I instead inverted input B, like this, this is now the converse negation. And as we discussed in implication gate, the converse simply means the inputs are reversed. So... Yeah, like that. And yeah, its big use is in combination with other logic gates if you want to invert one input and not the other. That, that's the big use. You usually don't use it by itself unless you're doing theory, but... Yeah. So that's the negation gates. We only have two gates left. You ready? It's the projection gate. Also known as P-projection. Which has code B12. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Projection's a weird name for a logic gate, isn't it? And well, yeah, it kinda is. The reason it's called that, to the best of my understanding, is because it's used in calculating the projection function in set notation. Now, I am no expert in set notation, so if any of you happen to be an expert in set notation and think that's wrong, feel free to correct me. That's just what I've heard about the reason it exists, so yeah. Now, as you can probably tell from the black hole, its big use is in redstone theory. And all it does is you flip input A, it sends it through. And input B is essentially ignored. Now, I know that probably seems absolutely useless to you in every way you can imagine, but it can be used in some cases. I actually have a case where I used it once, which I'll explain after I talk about this a little bit more. It's like the negation gate, the projection gate's the gate where... You're really not just going to want to only e want the output of it. You're also probably going to want what input B is. So it's just a type of gate proje the projection gate is. Just like the negation gate where you usually want to have input B by itself in addition to the output. So the, a big use for it, again, is in theory. But I, like I said, I actually did use this gate once in a practical application. I was building a redstone device that could redirect a redstone current, and not exactly like a demultiplexer, but, you know, it was designed to redirect current in the same way a, res a real-life transistor redirects current. 
And I actually did end up using this gate like this, because the logic for redirecting current and the way transistors redirect current is a little bit on the weird side, so yeah. So there is some practical application for it, but again, big use from the black hole, as you can tell, in theory. And the final logic gate? Anticlimatically, converse projection, also known as Q-projection. This projects input B instead of input A. And in case you're wondering, the reason these things are called P, P and Q, like where it's P negation and Q negation and P projection and Q projection, to my understanding, that's because it's in electronics. Input A is called P and input B is called Q. I'm not an electrician, so I wouldn't know that for sure, but that's my understanding. And yeah. So there you go. That's all 18 logic gates. The seven practical ones, and the eleven sort of weird, obscure ones that you're not going to use all that much. But they're all used, and, you know, they all have their use. So, if you know this, you know all logic gates. And this also concludes level two. So, congratulations. After level three, which is going to talk about basic redstone circuits, I'll, I'd consider you to have mastered intermediate redstone. So, if you make it that far, congratulations, you've mastered the first half of intermediate redstone. And just as a reminder, the importance of these gates is they're the basis of all redstone circuitry. And the design is not the important part. I have to emphasize that. Even though, especially in the first seven, we did spend a lot of time talking about designs, it's not the important part. The important part is the concept of what the gate's doing. That's why I hid all the wiring in these white, temple circuity things. Because it's about the concept of what the redstone's doing, not the redstone that's actually doing it. So there. Hope you enjoyed. And in the next video, we'll be starting Level 3, which will talk about basic redstone circuits, which are also frequently used for certain functions. So thank you, and see you next time.